other writers about my book, 99 Eric's, one of the first things they often ask me is, so who's your agent? Because according to writer's lore, agents fulfill the mythical gatekeeper role. They supposedly recognize your true genius and passionately believe in you so much that they do all the things that you would rather not be bothered with. They shop your book around the publishers, negotiate your contract, contact media on your behalf, etc., so that you don't have to worry your pretty little head about such trivial matters. Because you are a genius, and you need to focus 100% of your energy and attention on your next groundbreaking artistic art endeavor, which is most likely a young adult novel, wherein the protagonist befriends a wizard, or a vampire, or an angel, or something of that ilk, who ultimately helps them unlock their true potential and enables them, enables them to save the world. Because wizards are to insecure teenagers as agents are to writers. Yes. <laughs> so unsurprisingly, these waiting to be discovered writers are always shocked when I tell them that I don't have an agent, nor do I need one, because I am totally DIY. Okay. And nor, <laughs> nor do I bother indiscriminately sending my manuscripts off to publishers in the hopes that they will become interested in my work. Such an approach is pointless, as your manuscript merely becomes one, of a, one stack of papers on top of a much larger stack of other stack of papers. No, what you need to do is to make yourself stand out from all the other wannabe writers out there. So here's what I do to stand out. I carefully research book publishers in order to find one or two who seem to be a perfect match for my work. Then, I seek out the home address of the, for the acquisitions editor of the publishing house. Then, I put together an impromptu poetry slam for them on their front lawns. <laughs> now, I know what some of you are likely thinking. Cat, isn't that kind of creepy and stalkery to show up at a publisher's home with a poetry, poetry slam-sized contingent of people? I really don't think so. It's not like I'm going around peeking in their, their windows or following them around from place to place. I am simply giving them a gift. The gift of poetry slam. <laughs> Some have suggested to me that even if poetry slam does not, does not strictly constitute stalking, it is nevertheless non-consensual. <laughs> and I'm like, but of course. Poetry slams are supposed to be non-consensual. It's in their very nature. I cannot tell you how many times I've been sitting in my local bar, drinking an IPA, and writing in my journal, as you do, when all of a sudden, all these people come pouring in, and they start setting up for a poetry slam without even asking my permission. But hey, when at the bar, do as the bar does. So of course, I sign up to read. And suddenly, I start getting all excited about reading my newest thing. You know, that fresh piece. The one that's super intense and visceral and confessional and like totally fucking real. But unfortunately, it is also super duper in need of major edits. After all, I just wrote it today, literally only moments ago, as the non-consensual poetry slam organizers were first barging into the spa without asking me first. And naturally, I can't help <laughs> and naturally, I can't see how blatantly in need of editing this hand-scrawled behemoth of raw literature is. Because after all, it's my fresh piece. The one that expresses all the emotions that I'm currently feeling. And don't you dare try to edit all the emotions that I'm currently feeling right now at this moment. <laughs> and at most open mics, the ones that are not poetry slams, this is no big deal. You can read the fresh piece and people will solemnly listen to you. This is probably because they're just biding their time, and so it's their turn to read their fresh piece. But at Poetry Slams, it's different because of the fucking judges, who will give you, like, 5.8s or 6.2s for your work, work which you know in your heart of hearts is really, really worth a 10, or at least a 9.2. <laughs> and the kicker is that these so-called judges they might not even be writers like you. Like, they are likely to be like fucking lay people. Like that guy who gave me the 5.8 is probably some dude bro who just so happened to be in the bar before the slam even started, drinking his IPA, albeit Sam's writer journal. 
Hell, it probably wasn't even not gay. It was probably like a Budweiser or Coors or some shit. <laughs> Come to think of it, I'll bet you this guy showed up at the bar with his dude bro pals to watch the football game that was on TV earlier. You know, the one where the team named after the subpopulation of Northern Europeans, infamous for their conquering and pillaging, metaphorically slaughtered a football team named after indigenous people who in real life were slaughtered, conquered, and pillaged by a more historically recent subpopulation of Northern Europeans. Not to mention the fact that the latter team is totally racist. So like, how is this half-drunk dude bro, who only moments ago was metaphorically rooting for Northern Europeans to slaughter Native Americans, ever possibly going to understand your, <laughs> sorry, your sex-positive feminism rooted absurdist, yet highly confessional fresh piece? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> of course, my swing score probably would have been higher if it weren't for the fact that the woman who went on before me was like the most polished poet ever. She not only had her piece memorized, but she was making all these grand gestures with her hands, and her facial expresses, expressions were really emotive. And by the end of the piece, there was this whole call and response thing that just organically developed between her and the audience, and suddenly you find yourself joining in at the call and response, and you are totally loving this woman until you're like, holy crap, I have to go on after her. <laughs> And in the way, <laughs> we, we've all been there. I'm a recovering slam poet. We have all been there, okay? <laughs> we've all had. This is coming from real experiences, albeit filtered through cat cataclysm. Okay, anyway, and in the wake of all the calm responses, laughter and cheers, not to mention all the spontaneous snapping that poet generated, my fresh piece ends up being greeted with absolute unadulterated silence a science that feels so respectful and makes you feel like the audience is really intently listening when it happens at a regular open mic. But, which is a clear sign that your fresh piece is going over like a lead balloon when it happens at the poetry slam. You got it. So then you decide to commit yourself seriously and you start memorizing and choreographing all of your pieces, even the mediocre ones. <laughs> Like okay, real life experiences. <laughs> and and you, start, you start going to slams all the time. The San Francisco slams on Sundays, the Berkeley slam on Wednesdays, the Oakland slam on Thursdays, and so on. Plus going to occasional non-poetry slam open mics where you suddenly totally shine. Because now you are the polished performer. And the poetry slams, your score has definitely improved quite a bit. But eventually, over time, you come to realize that there is an upper limit for you. A poetry slam glass ceiling, if you will. <laughs> because it turns out that slam audiences really only want to hear one of three types of poems. The really funny one, the righteous political one, and the overcoming adversity one. <laughs> and you don't like to talk about politics anymore. And your life coping me mechanism is to not to talk about the overversity adversity you face. <laughs> and, and you think your poems are really funny, but they're more surreal and subversive, and the audience only seems to get straightforward vanilla humor. <laughs> and your most hilarious piece is the one where you casually mention that time that you were at a party, having a conversation with your ex, her current partner, your partner, and your current partner's other partner. <laughs> and you make your former U.S. Surgeon General Gen C. Everett Coop joke about how when he said during the AIDS crisis, quote, when you have sex with someone, you're having sex with everyone they have ever had sex with for the last 10 years. And everyone they and their partners have ever had sex with for the last 10 years, end quote. And how, when he said that, you probably never imagined all of you hanging out at the same party, talking and laughing with one another. And it's a pretty funny joke, you think. Except that a big chunk of the audience has no idea of who C. Everett Coop was. And on top of that, you start to notice that the audience, who had been laughing along quite boisterously up to that point, are suddenly not laughing so much anymore. And you realize that this is because you have invoked polyamory. And the audience is now thinking, 
oh my god, this person is not like me after all. I can no longer relate to their experiences. Or maybe they were thinking, this is hilarious, but if I laugh along too loudly, my friends will suspect that I am in a polyamorous relationship myself. <laughs> Either way, <laughs> the response is tepid from there on out. <laughs> At that moment, it becomes crystal clear that you have just wasted two years of your life honing your poetry slam skills when what you really want to do all along is to become a novelist, albeit one who eventually settles for being a critically acclaimed absurdist short fiction writer. <laughs> That's part of the rest of the book. <laughs> and Poetry Slam has not helped you at all towards your end goal. I mean, at the slams, some people will cheer you on and appreciate your work. So it's easy to presume that you are building a following there. But the truth is, these people are not really here for you. They are not your fans. They follow the Poetry Slam, not you. And when you, show, when you stop showing up to their slams, and instead you become the featured reader at some absurdist focus and or polyamory friendly literary event, <laughs> not mutually exclusive, <laughs> these people will not show up. Believe me, I know firsthand. So you can spend the next three or four months drinking yourself into a stupor, lamenting those two wasted poetry slam years of your life. Or, if you're clever and marginally entrepreneurial like me, you can exploit poetry slam. How? By becoming a poetry slam organizer yourself. That way, those slam goers become your followers. And if you strategically coordinate your poetry slams to occur on the front lawns of your potential publishers, not as a gift, not in a creepy, stalkery way at all, then, well, the more power to you. Thanks. <laughs>